ワちゃん男の子のくせに女の子のお人形好きなのよワワちゃんなんて大嫌い My Dress Up Darling is one of those shows that could easily be misconstrued for one of its more basic peers, mistaken for merely the sum of its tropes. However, it doesn't waste time getting to any given point and speeds through its genre's most cliche but seemingly mandatory story beats and themes within minutes instead of episodes. Its jokes actually make me laugh, from the gut, unlike many of the jokes from its slice of life, rom com, and even pure comedy peers. Some of which I genuinely enjoy, but just don't find all that funny moment to moment. The animation is gorgeous, especially in the moments when they know that you're going to appreciate it. Yes, the fan service is top tier, but it definitely goes deeper than that, with comedy enhancing visuals and unique graphic elements that break up otherwise monotonous one room conversation scenes, which would be plain boring in most other shows. Although the source material is a manga, you could be forgiven for thinking it might be a light novel. Lots of standing around in rooms talking, as well as the classic, etchy followed by hilarity ensues formula. However, as well as having far nicer visual production values than most shows of its sort and variety, it keeps the visuals interesting moment to moment with tons of cutaways to visualizations of the aforementioned conversations. That was a mouthful. As well as having tons of details in the way of gestures and mannerisms through the characters' hands and faces. This is also one of those shows that teeters back and forth between extremely wholesome and very much etchy, which is something I personally adore when done exceptionally well. I love bouncing from the cliche but sweet touching scenes to the perverted jokes and brief but beautifully animated fan service, particularly in this case, because those brief, high quality, etchy moments and the perhaps not always intentional moments of hilarity actually do a genuinely good job of once again breaking up what could easily have been a boring, same old, same old story about a sad MC coon who is out of touch because of his interests and doesn't have friends or whatever. Which is actually sort of what this story is about. Except that it's actually good. One of my absolute highest praises is how the show expertly breaks rules and gets away with it scot free, blending moods or tones that don't typically go together, having lengthy scenes of two characters talking in the same room while managing to keep the visuals as well as the conversations interesting moment to moment, and using occasional, highly cliche, but in this case, effective story beat tropes. One prime example, which I'd hardly consider a spoiler because of just how tropey it is, comes to mind. I was feeling we might be going into a slightly played out scenario when our MC Kun became scared of embarrassing our popular MC Chan. But they not only kept it funny throughout, <laughs> they also made quick work of that plot point in approximately two and a half minutes. That shows some real self awareness, so who even cares if it's a cliche? Mere minutes later, our MC Kun has already gained some meaningful confidence in their relationship by being genuinely and uniquely useful to her as a unique individual with unique skills. Can you imagine it? Real character development out of a trope within minutes? What? That's impossible! That's the beauty of simplicity well executed. I also love how right out of the gate in episode one, Marin, the occasional author surrogate, just says out loud all of the basic core ideas of the primary self improvement message in simple terms, letting our MC Kun know exactly what he needs to put into action to start improving his quality of life and learn how to literally exist in society properly without being taken advantage of by people who aren't even his real friends. There's a finality to it that just that early in whispered, don't worry, bro. We're not going to spend 12 episodes or whatever solving this very much relatable but ultimately basic issue. We're going to have some real fun with this. That initial core message is simple but sweet and executed well. The show's soundtrack, including the stylish opening and ending, even including the most happy go lucky background beats. Come off less as cheesy and forced as with many similar shows, and more as theatrical and one might even say a bit classy. As cheesy as that might sound. I fully realize subversive is an overused, dirty word in the anime analysis community, but it certainly subverts its own character tropes at the very least, and throws you a couple of curveballs with the jokes, such as when Marin offers Gojo some of her food, creating an obvious setup for the well played out, oops, I offered someone an indirect kiss joke only for her embarrassment to actually stem from the fact that she eats often and misunderstands his indirect kiss embarrassment 
as him thinking she'll outgrow her cosplay outfit before it's finished. That on its own is certainly not wholly unique in the many comparable subgenres, but I do think that the show does it very well and in interesting ways. But anyways, what's this show even about? Cosplay. My Dress Up Darling is the story of a seemingly lecherous but actually dead innocent man coming to grips with the culture of an ironically drop-dead gorgeous and popular babe who's actually really into eroge, cosplaying, and simping for e-thoughts on Instagram and Twitter, which is really quite relatable. Wait, what? He, on the other hand, is actually initially borderline repulsed and confused by how depraved and degenerate, aka cultured, her tastes are, but ultimately respects her love for this world once unknown to him and empathizes with her passion for this surrogate to his own outcast passion of making and dressing Hina dolls. I know it sounds hard to believe, but her somewhat perfectly matched desire and dream of cosplaying as her favorite Aroge character actually ends up coming off as genuinely endearing, even if it might sound cheesy and contrived on the surface. This is much due to the general quality of execution, but also just the balls the show has to do whatever it wants moment to moment. It teeters back and forth between its most trope-filled and wholesome scenes and its very much etchy and comedic scenes, occasionally breaking all of those previously mentioned rules of consistent tone or whatever, and blending the two together into something that ends up feeling extremely wholesome nonetheless, because the character writing and production is just so much better than the vast majority of similar shows. While the fan service is certainly fan service, of the highest class might I add, much of the degeneracy actually helps to build a world that feels less like the extremes that are polite America and literal porn, and more like the real world, where in any given high school you can likely, perhaps reliably, find both the innocent to a fault types and the comfortably degenerate, lewd, cursing, teasing types ready to corrupt them. The dynamics of the character writing really is a huge part of this, as I think is true with any anime or manga that can pull off these sort of hard turns effectively. While Kitagawa may seem perfect superficially, it's clear that she wasn't able to make the costumes she wanted properly, even with clear guidance, and feels very much like she's hit a brick wall, and not for lack of trying. I definitely got some hints early on that she might also be a tad lacking in self-awareness, for better or for worse, and perhaps they both are in some ways. That seeming lack of self-awareness blended perfectly in with her seemingly stoic nature, but as we well find out, even she has her limits and can become flustered and embarrassed. While it might have seemed that lack of self-awareness or stoic nature was in full effect on her passion for anime and eroge games in episode 1, it turns out she's quite used to people not really understanding her interests, and certainly not actually trying out the games she recommends, as Gojo was willing to do. To step away from the character fawning for a moment, I know some complain that the show, and certainly this character, would be a 10 out of 10 if only it weren't for the fan service. And of course, we call those people oh, idiots. What a stupid son of a bitch. More importantly, an absolute commitment to quality is present, and not just in the animation of our titillating heroine herself. Those cutaways to interesting, colorful, unique graphic visuals and little knowledge bombs on relevant topics that exist all throughout, yes, even many of the just fan service scenes, really sealed the deal. They not only showed that there was real passion behind animating these scenes, but also kept scene visuals interesting, once again in those scenes that take place in a single room, and could easily be boring for someone who just isn't all that into the fan service alone. But, I rest my case. Come on, man! To pull off all of these potentially jarring flip-flops of tone, it's also important that the comedy is actually funny. And it is. If it's not obvious enough, much of the humor is at the expense of our main characters, Gojo in particular. In that sense, the show does have some of the same vibes as shows such as Master Teaser Tagagi-san, Uzaki-chan Wants to Hang Out, Please Don't Bully Me Nagatoro-san, My Senpai is Annoying, and etc. So if you're one of those people who constantly goes online to complain every time another cute girl teases guy or guy teases girl incessantly show comes out, <laughs> this probably won't be your cup of tea. Fortunately for me, I eat those up, and it seems to somehow never stop being funny to me. I realize explaining a joke is never going to be as funny, but some of my personal <laughs> biggest laughs, aside from the more visual humor, included the following two scenarios. Scenario 1. Gojo is obliviously watching what essentially amounts to porn in front of his grandpa while he's studying the Rogue Kitagawa recommended him. 
This is made even funnier by the fact that his grandpa is the one person who knows well just how dead innocent he is. And now he's suddenly watching cartoon porn and taking notes on what he sees with a focused and purely observant face. Scenario 2. The thought of Kitagawa dressing as and personifying her favorite Aroge character haunts his sleep. He awakes from the likely wet dream, only to realize the Hina doll he left out is staring at him in pure shame. Later on in the third episode, I got another nice laugh when the pair exited a ramen shop, obliviously discussing the finer details of that glorious aroge that she recommended him play and research. Maybe I'm just a bit slow on picking it up in this case, but I think they pulled off something fairly subtle and a tad more important than the laugh itself here. That obliviousness, that lack of self-awareness, stoicism, or dare I optimistically say, that simple confidence in the value of personal passions and interests, irregardless of judgment, seems to have started to gradually wear off onto Gojo thanks to his exposure to Kitagawa. I think that's just another of many examples that reinforces the fact that even in the moments where my dress-up darling is somewhere between titillating degeneracy and ludicrous hilarity, there tends to be not only general high-quality presentation, but often something deeper at work throughout each and every scene. While this scene in particular was certainly degenerate and played for gags, given the context surrounding it, it's actually quite endearing and totally wholesome in a unique way that you just won't find elsewhere. But with all that fluff out of the way, I know why you're really here. Is Kitagawa-san the top tier waifu and best girl of the season? Well, I haven't watched any of that other crap yet, but yes, yes, she is. And now for an excerpt from Words of Wisdom by Marin Kitagawa-san. You need to speak up about how you're feeling, for your own sake. Does being a girl or a boy matter when you really like something? Mama went to the bank. It's important to have things you refuse to compromise on. All right, let me explain. The reason that we have um, so many B-movies coming out of the Christian community is because the Christian community uh, serves people who, when they are th thinking of themselves as Christians, will not watch real life. They think that God is the God of Candyland, where people don't swear, where people don't have sex, where if people have sex, they get pregnant or they get punished. None of those things is true, and so all those stories are not representing real life. That's what makes them B-movies.